in February of 2009, I not only had a chance to sound off for 18 minutes, <laughs> but they granted me a wish. Had to be a big wish, a wish large enough to change the world. Well, my wish was, I wish you would use all means at your disposal, films, expeditions, new submarines, the web, and more, to ignite public support for a global network of marine protected areas, hope spots, large enough to save and restore the ocean, the blue heart of the planet. How much? Some say 10%. Some say 30%, whatever it is, the current level of less than 1% in 2009, is simply not enough, <laughs> not enough. You may be among the diminishing number of people who would ask, why wish that? <laughs> Isn't the ocean big enough, resilient enough to take care of itself? That is the attitude that took place during the pre-plasticozoic. Uh, I was there. <laughs> I was there in the 50s and 60s when it seemed that our job was to put things into the ocean, anything that we didn't want, quotes, in our backyard. And to take out of the ocean whatever we wanted, oil, gas, minerals, and certainly wildlife, otherwise known as fish, <laughs> whales, shrimp, lobsters, whatever. A, sort of a Neanderthal attitude about wildlife. Eat it, go catch it. That was good enough 10,000 years ago when there were very few of us and the natural world was large. Now, with close to 7 billion of us, I guess we actually have passed that number, 7 billion. Can we continue to feed ourselves with wildlife? How many songbirds, how many little furry things from the land would it take to feed 7 billion people? How many fish can we extract from the sea and continue to get away with it? Well, we're learning that we can't get away with taking at the level that we've been trying to extract and not succeeding in maintaining anything like sustainability from the sea. Some people say, well, so what? If the ocean is in trouble, it doesn't affect me. I mean, I don't swim, I don't eat fish, I get seasick, <laughs> so I don't go out there in boats. If the ocean dried up tomorrow, some people ask, what difference would it make to me? Well, is there a picture up there? There it is. Yes. The world is blue. Take away the ocean, and what have you got? You've got a place a bit like our sister planet, Mars, the, the beautiful red planet. No big ocean there, although apparently there was one once. Water is the key to life. There is some water on Mars. There may be some life on Mars where the atmosphere is largely carbon dioxide, the way the early Earth's atmosphere is thought to have been. It's taken four and a half billion years of fine-tuning to get a planet that kind of works in our favor. If we went back a billion years, the level of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere would still be at a level inhospitable for us. This is a planet that, right now, works in a way that causes us to have everything that we care about. What do you care about? The economy? Your health? Security? <laughs> do you like to live? <laughs> do you like to breathe? <laughs> do you like water? Well, water is the key. No blue, no green. No green, no oxygen. No green, no food for most creatures on Earth. There are some who are really eager to do what it takes to make Mars more Earth-like so that we have a, an escape route, <laughs> a place to go should we make this planet less hospitable than it currently is. Terraforming Mars, well, at the same time that we're dreaming of doing that, it looks as though we're doing a pretty good job of mars forming Earth. Think of it, more carbon dioxide in the atmosphere than when I was a child, and the pace is picking up. We're certainly transforming the carpet, the fabric of life, in a major sort of way. <laughs> Nowhere more 
evident than in Southern California where the carpet of life has been paved over to a very large extent. But it's not just the land, it's also the sea where we are transforming the nature of nature with trawls that scrape the ocean floor to bring us things that we are for now enjoying like shrimp and bottom-dwelling fish at a level that simply cannot be sustained. At the same time that we are changing the nature of nature, changing our life support system, the planet that keeps us alive, we are learning more. More has been learned literally about the ocean and all other aspects of, of the, the world and all that that is beyond this planet. We've learned more since the middle of the 20th century than during all preceding human history put together. It's the same time we've lost more. But knowing about the losses and knowing why it matters is a first giant step toward a solution. So, we now have the means to not only go high in the sky and look back on ourselves from afar, we also can go deep in the ocean. But it's still frustrating when you consider that aviation, the reach for sky, the sky, and aerospace, never mind that this country is kind of stepping back from our commitment to space exploration, we're still also behind when it comes to exploring the ocean and making the technological commitments needed to get down to where we can't go holding our breath alone. Russia has three submersibles that can go to 6,000 meters a little bit more than half the ocean's depth. China is about to, has just launched a submersible that within a year is expected to go to 7,000 meters. It will be the deepest diving manned submersible in the world. Japan has one, France has one. Where are we in this? We lost our deep diving capacity in the year of the ocean, curiously, in 1998 when the sea cliff was retired. We do have undersea robots, including one from the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution, that can go to the deepest place in the sea. Great, and we should be doing this. That's the Mariana Trench. But it was 50 years ago that the first and only descent to the deepest sea was made. We haven't gone back, no one has gone back since. What are we waiting for? I mean, it's there to be done. Wouldn't you like to go seven miles down into the ocean and, and check out What's going on? I mean, people fly seven miles up in the sky eating lunch and watching movies. Seven miles <laughs> under the sea should be no big deal. <laughs> Think of what's out there. It's most of life on Earth. You go down a thousand feet, which is just the skin of the ocean, the average depth is, is two and a half miles after all. But a thousand feet is where the sunlight shines. Below that, it's dark. It's dark all of the time, except for the flash, sparkle, and glow of luminous creatures that can make their own firefly kind of light. With every gulp of a whale shark, it's possible to take in maybe a dozen or 14 or 15 of the major groups of animals that live on Earth. There are only about 30, some say 35, and only about 15 live on all of the land put together, but in a bucket of water, in a mouthful of plankton, a whale shark can consume the diversity of life that rivals all of the diversity of life on the land in terms of the big, broad divisions. The ocean is where the action is. Don't you want to go check it out? I mean, maybe you are already. This is where we need to go. And whether we're diving, whether we're using submersibles or robots, we really need to explore this part of the solar system, this part of the universe. And we need to think small, not just big. I love the big things, the whales, the whale sharks, the fish and all the rest, but the tiny creatures from the microbes that generate most of the oxygen that we breathe. Some say more than half, others say 70% of the oxygen in the atmosphere comes from bacteria and plankton in the sea that churns out oxygen, grabs carbon dioxide, and basically shapes the way the world works. Copepods feed upon them. The numerous little creatures that are fed upon by other creatures. Krill in the Antarctic and in the high Arctic. Actually, there are about 70 species of krill, shrimp-like creatures, that are the middlemen in food chains in the sea. We should leave them alone because they are a part of the chemistry of the ocean. 
should leave these guys alone too. Well, mostly we don't eat them, but we certainly eat a lot of crustaceans. We still dine on a lot of wildlife from the sea. And calamari, oh my goodness, the biggest, biggest calamari in the sea is the, you know, the giant one that um, has only recently been seen alive. Otherwise, it was only sort of a mythological creature that whalers talked about seeing a glimpse of this monster creature. But we are the monsters, really, who are the largest predators on the planet when it comes to taking wildlife from the sea. And once you've seen a squid sort of eye to eye, it's hard to look at calamari the same way <laughs> again. <laughs> and sponges, you know, starfish, the whole range of life. And fish, of course. Jerry Schubel, you're in the audience somewhere. These are your buddies there at the aquarium. You can go and get face to face with a fish yourself if you don't dive down in the ocean personally. I consider aquariums to be halfway houses for fish and people. <laughs> you can get nose to nose and see them swimming with something other than lemon slices and butter. <laughs> you'd, <laughs> you'd never know what they look like unless you do just that. Go check them out. We used to eat a lot of turtles, and in some parts of the world they still do, but their numbers are so, so heartbreakingly low eight or nine species of sea turtles, and most of them are, are dangerously threatened. Whales have made a comeback since we stopped, started to make a comeback since we stopped killing them, but that was fairly recent. 1986 was when most countries stopped commercial whaling, but, you know, a few countries, Norway, Iceland, and Japan, still market whales. Uh, they take whales for, quote, scientific purposes and then put them in their restaurants and markets to dine upon. Whatever, the time has come to think differently about wildlife in the sea. Yes, dolphins are still taken in the Faroe Islands and, of course, in Japan and a few other places in the world as a source of food. It's just a small step away from other vertebrates, though, from the, our fellow mammals to our fellow fish and other creatures that are critically important to making the world function as it does. A couple of weeks ago, I was diving in Chesapeake Bay, not the most pristine part of the planet, but it is one of my favorite places, a hope spot, if you will, because there's hope. If we really pull back and stop killing at the re level that we currently are, there is hope that, as with the whales that have begun to recover since we stopped killing them, maybe Maybe we'll see a recovery of shrimp and lobsters and orange roughy here taken from 2,000 feet beneath the surface of the sea. It takes 30 years for them to mature. It takes about 30 minutes for you to dine on one at a restaurant. They sell for about $9, $8.99 a pound at my local supermarket up in Oakland, California, but they may live to be 200 years old. Wouldn't you like to know how to live to be 200 years old? Maybe if we look at them and learn from them instead of just eating them, we might find out. Bluefin tuna, once considered a tr so-called trash fish, something you feed to the cats and dogs, or now it is the, the shishi thing to eat with shishi sushi <laughs> and sashimi and other fine dining. But bluefin tuna, when I was chief scientist at NOAA, I learned that their numbers were down by, by uh, 90 percent, like many other fish in the sea. Sharks are among the most threatened. I used to be worry a bit about being eaten by sharks. Now sharks have to be worried about being eaten by us. I was in Hong Kong earlier this week and saw this in the streets where they're drying shark fins for that luxury dish known as shark fin soup. But reasons for hope. About a thousand school kids in Hong Kong gathered to take the pledge. We want to protect sharks and we will never eat shark fin soup. How about that? Along with Yao Ming <laughs> and Jackie Chan. Sharks are too important in the ocean. They deserve our respect. They deserve to live. Not just for us, but for all those munchkins coming along. Sharks are not at the table to vote, shall there or shall there not be sharks. Whales aren't at the table to vote, will there or will there not be whales. The kids of the future are not at the table 
to vote. It's up to us to take action, to determine their future and ours. I want to take a moment, we have just a few minutes, to bring you up to date on what happened with a wish. One thing that has happened is that a film is being produced that will be launched presumably at Sundance next January. It will be called Mission Blue. Mission Blue, the implementation of this wish to try to protect the blue heart of the planet. And you can all sign up to be a part of Mission Blue. Could we have that little video clip, please? This is just a trailer, a taste of what will be shown starting in January. Fifty years ago, when I began exploring the ocean, it seemed at that time to be a sea of Eden. But now we know we are now facing paradise lost. This trip is absolutely brand new for Ted. We've never done anything like it before. The trip came about because of a wish that Ted granted Sylvia Earle. I hope for your help to explore and protect the wild ocean in ways that will restore the health and, in so doing, secure hope for humankind. Sylvia Earle has devoted her life to this passion of the oceans. And the need for knowledge about all aspects of the environment, whether on the land or on the sea. I've always been a scientist. I am a scientist. But I've been transformed in part, I suppose, by having children and seeing that the places I knew as a child, I can't take them because they're gone. The trip is a bet that if you bring together a group of really remarkable people who are well resourced, some of the world's greatest marine scientists, some of the world's great storytellers, you put them together and you show them what's happening in the oceans. Something incredible is going to happen. I was raised with a great respect for nature, but I never added the ocean to that. And to be able to be in a place like the Galapagos, to actually get into the water and see some of the creatures that we're talking about has changed my life. Getting people to not only understand intellectually, but to know with their hearts that we're so changing the way the world works that our future is at risk. The type of fishing going on today is really wiping bluefin ecologically off the planet. Whale meat being sold in these markets was really dolphin meat, and it was toxic. There's uh, around 100 million sharks caught every year, so this is a, a truly global problem. We're literally sucking like a straw life right out of this planet. And so the idea of hope spots, the idea of protected areas is like, whoa, you know? But it's got to be big, and it's got to be real, and you got to have people with guns out there to protect it because it sure as hell isn't going to be protected by wishful thinking or let's all go off and sing Gumbaya. But if we wait another 50 years or even another 10 years, things we can do now will be gone. There is no more tomorrow that we can avoid confronting. Jindal has declared a state of emergency because of the spill. What's at stake for the environment as the oil begins to touch land? And to me, crude oil ain't nothing but the devil. Man is destroying the planet. Just like the Bible says. In greed and time, you will destroy your own earth, and that's what's happening. Scientists in Mississippi are trying to gauge the impact of the spill as it starts to spread into the prime habitat of the biggest fish in the Gulf. These animals are here to feed during this time, and this oil spill is right in their backyard. They're on death row. If for nothing else good comes of this major spill, it may be to wake up people to say we have to protect the Gulf. There are real issues here of money and power. It's life itself that the ocean is delivering. And we have been abusing the ocean. We haven't been caring for the ocean. Why don't we write to the 100 world leaders? There must be some place where these forests of unique creatures can be safe. 
And Sylvia's timing is perfect. This is that moment. The government is on board. And this bill is not only, we've heard it's the first in the United States, this is the first in the world. I do not want to envision a world for our grandchildren and great-grandchildren that doesn't have workers, that doesn't have hammerhead sharks, because we're all connected. I'm here because Sylvia Earle is one of the most remarkable women on earth. She's the real thing. She's a person who has committed herself and everything that that commitment implies. And we need more of that. We really need a healthy ocean if we are personally to survive. We still have a chance, but now's the time. Now is the time. That's it. Thank you. An idea worth spreading. Thank you.